Um, right, yes, it's very much a team effort, this one. Um, I'm going to be presenting the work of the modeling team. And uh, just want to give a, a very brief introduction to the modeling team and who's done what, an overview of the role of modeling within the project, um, and whiz through three of the more complete models that we have produced. And then um, a little bit of talk about the future of compute simulation um, of submerged landscapes, because I think the, 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 there's a lot of research of submerged landscapes still yet to do, and there's a lot of compute simulation still yet to do. So, uh, so a little bit of a look at the future. Um, as Ben said, um, the modeling teams, uh, Tabitha, Eugene, Mihal, and me. Um, Tabitha did an awful lot of the research behind um, the first two models that I'm going to be presenting here, sea level change and erosion and deposition. Um, Eugene has done work on um, an advanced piece of infrastructure for doing um, large, uh, large models um, in a high performance environment. Me Hall has been working on the forest growth dynamics and I've been doing the rest of the stuff, which is I suppose mainly the design and programming of, of models one and two based on Tabitha's data. Um, as far as the role of modeling within the project goes, um, one of the, the key elements is that of data integration. As you've seen from today, there are a lot of disparate sets of data um, with their own strengths, their own limitations. And um, a computer simulation environment was seen as um, a suitable one to, to bring all those together. Um, because um, it's not just incorporating the data from the project, but it's incorporating research data from other projects and also processes that are um, available from um, other disciplines. And um, this is one thing that computer simulation allows us to do is it allows us to treat data and the processes behind that data equally. Um, and that's particularly important for submerged landscape research because the data is really difficult and expensive to get. And sometimes it's under tens of meters of marine sand and sometimes it's been eroded away. Um, so the, the difficulty of getting primary data um, is to a certain extent compensated by the other things that you can bring in with a computer simulation environment. And um, more than any other um, archeological tool, certainly, it treats a four-dimensional environment in a four-dimensional way. Dog land to land change from the, the last glacial maximum through to the inundation is constantly changing. And as a result, we need a tool that can deal with change over time. And computer simulation is a lot better in that way than traditional tools such as GIS, that kind of thing. And um, also one of the things, one of the things I particularly am enthusiastic about with computer simulation is asking the question, what would that look like? And it's important to draw the distinction between um, asking that question about Doggerland, what would Doggerland look like? Um, because that recreation is not what we're trying to do. Basically, it allows us to look at, for instance, the data in the cores to produce a, a hypothesis regarding how that data got there, whether it's taphonomic or whether it relates to the, the environment around the core. Um, and when we produce a mental model to explain that, we can use computer simulation to ask the question, what would that mental model look like um, if it was a, a simulated system that we could play around with? That we, what are the implications of our hypotheses when it comes to the landscape as a whole? And that's um, it's a very important point with the computer simulation is we're simulating hypotheses. We are not recreating Doggerland as a, as a complete environment. So um, just to illustrate that, um, the first model that was produced um, deals with sea level change. And there are a number of long-term sea level change models out there produced by a variety of different research projects uh, for a variety of different purposes based on a variety of different data. Um, and what they do is they provide a, a model of how the, the sea level changes over time. And our question, what would that look like, is what would the results of those look like those models look like if we um, applied them to the Southern River Valley and if we applied them to the time scale of that would be noticeable by humans, um, what would those long-term sea level change models look like? What are the implications of them to the inhabitants of Dogland? Um, so we created a model um, that 
produces two main outputs, one of which is kind of a simulated inundation history of a particular point in the landscape. Um, and the other is a look at the landscape as a whole. And this is the, the kind of input data that we have. This is um, a model of uh, sea level change over the last 21,000 years produced by Sarah Bradley and her collaborators within and without the British project. Um, Sarah has been very helpful to us over the, the process of putting this, uh, the data together for this model. Um, and as you can see here, you can you can look at this graph for relatively sea level change over 21,000 years, and you can see flatter areas, you can see steeper areas where the, the sea level rises relatively quickly. But I mean, what does relatively quickly mean on a human scale? What do, do the inhabitants of Dogland know that they are living in, a, in an inundating landscape? Um, and and there have been people who have um, expressed opinions about this, but actually we have with us within computer simulation a tool to provide a part of the of the of the picture that might lead us to an answer. It certainly won't give us an answer, but it will give us an extra bit of data that we couldn't get elsewhere. Um, this is, I'm not sure how well this is going to come over on Zoom, but this is a, a little animation of this model um, in action. Um, this is the Southern River Valley, and this it just plots where the sea level would be based on the long-term sea level curve and plausibly modeled short-term processes such as tides and weather. So you can see that, that kind of pulsing of the tides, that kind of thing. And it lines up quite well with, with modern um, sea level data. And we can produce things like this, which is a, it's a, a model of the inundation of a particular spot in the landscape. And the spot in our virtual landscape corresponds to the location of core EMF 005, which is in the Southern River Valley. And basically we used the outputs of nine different models for long-term sea level change, um, which are all um, plotted here. And the, 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 the kind of wiggliness of each line of the graph as it goes from 0% inundated before a wave has, has lapped over that particular point to 100% inundated, which is the, kind of the, the last time it sees the sky, as it were. Um, as you can see, the, um, all nine of these are, are different in some way. Um, and um, the, there's a wiggliness to it that represents the random nature of the, the effects of the weather, that kind of thing. But um, from, from the inundation process as a whole, from start to finish, within this model, and that's an important caveat that we'll get back to soon, within this model takes about 400, 450 years from the first wave to the, uh, to the last one. And we can inc incorporate other kinds of data. So for instance, we have two bars here, Bar A is the um, is uh, the last radiocarbon date from core ELF 005 from a, a pre-inundation context, and uh, Bar B is from intertidal mudflats. So, were these long-term sea level curves to be an accurate representation of the inundation of this location, you would expect. Um, date A to be before the start of the curve, and date B to be during the curve. Um, we can also, um, this is the um, output of the landscape as a whole based on just one of these curves. And we can split the landscape up into a series of different um, categories. The purple areas are areas with 0% inundation. The blue areas are areas with 100% inundation. And the different types of green are different percentages of inundation over a, a certain period of time. So they, the, the green areas are basically the intertidal zone. And they're listed on the pie charts as mudflats, low marsh, mid marsh, and high marsh. But don't don't take those categories too literally. Um, other factors are involved, obviously, in in those environments. Um, and as you can see, you can start to look at the Southern River Valley area, and you can you can start you can maybe even draw conclusions about how you think the inundation may have, have progressed over a period of time. And over fifteen hundred years, it goes from. Uh, very little marine influence to, to, to almost completely marine dominated. 
Um, it's important to point out what this model isn't and what it is. It's certainly not a recreation of the inundation of the Southern River Valley. There are um, very important processes in the real world that aren't in the model, and it's not a conclusion in and of itself. You can't present one of these maps as the, the answer to anything. And although we can do this, we can model this very precisely, um, that doesn't mean to say it doesn't give you any indication of accuracy. However, it is something that we can compare to all the other types of data that we have seen throughout the course of this day. It is its own thing. It is what happens when a static landscape surface interacts with the output of sea level change models combined with plausibly modeled short term processes. It's no more or less than that. And, um, and has to be taken as part of that. It is one of the tools for interpreting the landscape, not the answer to interpreting the landscape. Um, we can also use it for examining what's called data downscaling. So for instance, the curve, that sea level curve is, is only a curve because of the, the resolution of the data points, mainly the data points are every 500, 1000 years. And um, it may well be that the actual process is more of, of a stepped process in which you get periods of much quicker inundation followed by sort of periods of slower inundation, or maybe there's inundation and regression, that kind of thing. Maybe it's more of a wiggly one. And um, we can't give the answer to that, but we can model each of the alternatives and we can start to look for indicators that may be present in the, uh, in the landscape that, that would, would point towards one, of, one or other of those options. Model one has a very static landscape. It doesn't change in any way, shape or form. It's like, a, like, a, like it was carved in stone, as it were. Um, model two looks at processes of erosion and deposition. Um, it takes the same seismic data as a base. Um, it adds a, um, a, a rainfall model based on modern rainfall data, although you can, you can base it on anything you like. Um, and it allows us to introduce tokens into the system. And these are simulated bits of, uh, um, can represent environmental proxies, for instance. Basically what they do is they move with whatever Thing they're in, whether it's water or whether it's sediment, so they can they can flow over the landscape. They can end up in sediments. They can be um, they can be buried by other sediments. They can be eroded out, shifted. So it gives us some way of simulating environmental proxies. And this model produces three different types of outputs. It gives us the opportunity to pick a location in the landscape and do a virtual core. So it's um, we can core a particular location of this landscape in the same way that we can call the real landscape. We can produce a map where it tells us which areas are lower than they started, which areas are higher, which have net erosion, and which have net deposition. And we can also track the tokens as they go through the system. And just like the last one, this is a video of this model in action, uh, which doesn't do anything for a short while. But the, the blue areas are where water is, but there's no indication of depth on this one. Um, and then at some point it will rain and that rain will flow downhill. Um, you'll notice there's, there's no sea involved in this one and um, there's no explicit modeling of the Southern River. Although if you leave it running long enough, the river kind of creates itself. And as a result of that, we can get virtual cores. And one of the interesting things about um, this model is that um, the, the processes involved in the landscape are really simple. It, it rains, the water runs downhill, and based on how that, how that water moves, either stuff gets eroded or it gets redeposited. Um, however, um, that leads to really quite a large variance in, in, in output of, of of virtual cores. Um, you don't get much happening in some locations. These are just the core locations which feature only deposition. Um, you get the core location at L36, which is pretty regular over the, over the amount of time that this takes. But the other cores, they have, they have periods where lots of deposition occurs and then they have areas which not much deposition occurs. And this is, is purely a reflection of the local and the upstream system itself. So it's a series of kind of feedbacks that creates from a very simple system, actually quite complex outputs. These are the cores that feature only erosion. And this is um, the three cores in this particular simulation that have both erosion and deposition. And the interesting thing about these, of course, is we can display them as virtual cores. So they're analogous to the real cores that we get. 
Um, but of course, just like the real cause, we're missing data from that. Um, whereas if we if we show them here as the, the change of height, that location over time, you can actually see what bits of data you're missing. And that's one of the good things about computer simulation is I believe it's very important to have a simulation produce outputs that are analogous to the real archaeological data that you have. However, we can go beyond that and we can go back to the system and we can see which behaviors have created those, those outputs. Um, and this is just a, a map of 10 tokens in one another sim, um, a simulation. The tokens start on the red dot and end at the green dot. You can see some of them move quite away. Some of them don't move very far at all. And you can, you can track them over time. So you can see um, how, when they're moving. They, a, a lot of them move quite away to start with and then they stop. And then whether they move on from there depends on whether they're eroded out of the, of the, the deposits where they land. Again, not a conclusion on itself and certainly not a comprehensive model of all taphonomic processes. It's not even a sophisticated model of the taphonomic processes it involves. Um, but it's a necessary beginning because taphonomic modeling is, is likely to effectively have no end. Um, and it's in the process of modeling and the process of doing things, seeing the result, changing things of the, the endless iterative process of taphonomic modeling where you get the usefulness. It's what George Innes called developmental utility. It's not the necessarily the results that are directly applicable, but the process, which is the, the learning process. And just like the data downscaling, um, you, um, you can use this model for examining taphonomic processes themselves. You can change out the taphonomic processes um, and see what the, uh, the result would be. Now, um, this is uh, the basis of Meehall's PhD work, and this is his model on forest growth dynamics. And basically what this does is it takes a series of models that are, have been around for sort of 40 or 50 years now called forest gap models, and they're used in, in forest management um, and environmental science. Um, and it um, changes them from stand-based uh, models to agent-based models. So each tree is modeled individually. Um, you can then incorporate um, paleoclimate data with that. Um, so you can see how the changing climate affects forest dynamics. And you can also um, simulate human and animal activity and the removal of either a certain percentage of trees as a whole or, or different percentages of different species. Um, and as you can see here from the, the images in the in the lower left corner, this is just a series of snapshots from one or another simulation over nearly a thousand years. After 50 years, you have actually quite a homogeneous environment. After 300, it's starting to change up. And the stand dynamics of self-thinning and um, stand density and competition for light result in, over a period of time, quite a heterogeneous environment. And you can see this yourself if you've been, if you've been walking through a, um, a, an area of woodland that is uh, a plantation for the timber industry, for instance, compared with an ancient area of woodland, you can see the difference kind of instantly in the, in the, the, the makeup of the trees and, and the, the uniformity or lack thereof of the, uh, of the trees. Um, what this is, is it's the results of a series of simulations, but um, uh, this number in the top left hand corner starts at 0, 0.0 and that is just a, an environment with three different species of trees that are all competing against each other using natural dynamics. And the, there's an ever increasing amount of thinning that happens on year 50 of this 1000 year simulation um, going from 10% up to 80%. So at 0 0.8, then uh, at year 50 in the simulation, 80% of all trees are, are removed. The interesting thing about this is this obviously causes an effect in the, um, the, the environment, but the knock-on effect, the, the effect on the dynamics of the growth of the trees in the environment can be seen four, five, six hundred years into the future. Um, and this gives us confidence that we will be able to, um, working back from things like um, pollen, um, analyses of archaeological sites, what we may be able to do is detect markers of human activity actually quite some way into the future 
based on the, um, the very indirect traces of human activity. Again, it's not a recreation, but one of the good things about it is because it's based on forest gap models and a lot of research has gone into forest gap models and a lot of um, research has been done um, on looking at woodland to validate the forest gap models, then, then this is a very, it's, it's very well validated, particularly for a, an archeological model. It's also expandable. I mean, the, the model itself has far more than the three species that, that we've just shown, but um, you can theoretically use this anywhere. Um, and it's able to be integrated with future models. And if we combine models one, two, and three, which is, is the plan, um, it would give us a, a complex system that is, is very complex despite being based on simple individual behaviours that produces things in a format that we archaeologists can already understand and can relate to our primary data. So we can produce virtual cores with virtual proxies in them. It also gives us an almost, almost infinite parameter space to, uh, to explain that is the, 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 the number of potential um, combinations of variables that go into it. However, um, and this is one of the medium to long term aims of, of the computer simulation coming out of the project, is if we make these models as accessible as commercial software, as, as utilities, as, as, as games that you download for the, for the PC, that means that that parameter space can be explored by many more people. It's not just me. And it means that those people can explore these models for the questions they want rather than the questions I envisage. Um, and that drastically um, changes the, the, the way that simulation can contribute to archaeology. Um, in order to facilitate this, this um, uh, Eugene Chung has produced uh, an infrastructure that is able to run models that you would normally have to use a high performance computing cluster on, on a, a desktop PC that has a, a commercial graphics card in. And this, this slide alone could have 25 minutes spent on it, but we unfortunately we have to shoot past it. So as far as the future of computer simulation in submerged landscape goes, I want to highlight two things. And um, the first of which is we need the tool for data integration. It should be obvious at this point um, that um, even though we, we only have a tough fraction of the data that's available for Doggerland, we still have more data than we can comfortably squidge together very easily. Um, and we need the tool for data integration that includes processes, that includes change over time, but that also allows us to include introduce processes from um, from other disciplines um, and computer simulation is the best tool for that but the second point i want to make is is possibly more important in the long term and it's to do with the accessibility of the models because this relates to the accessibility of our of the results of archaeological research and of archaeological research itself Doggerland is equally inaccessible for all of us, unlike the vast majority of archaeological sites. Some of us can get to Stonehenge, some of us can get to various places, mm -hmm. but Dog none of us are going to Doggerland anytime soon. Um, and as a result, accessibility has to be built in from the very start for the tools that we use to research Doggerland. And that that people now who are currently find it hard to access both the results of archaeological research and the tools of archaeological research will get the benefit of our, um, our tool building endeavors. So we can produce these models, we can make these models accessible. Other people who might otherwise struggle to get involved in archaeology will have access to cutting edge tools that they can ask their questions, not ours about the archaeological data. And that has significant implications for the, the medium to long-term future of archaeology, not just submerged landscape archaeology. As always, um, just like everyone else has said, um, wouldn't have been possible without uh, all the different members of the, uh, of the team. And although the modeling team is the four of us, um, lots of other people here have been involved with various aspects of this. And that's about it. Thanks, Phil. That's some um, that's some wonderful timekeeping there. I'm 
extremely <laughs> impressed by that. Okay, so um, while everyone just uh, gathers themselves, um, we have a, a few minutes for talk, for questions here even. Um, I've got one here for you off Becky Bryant. Um, thank you for interesting talk. She has two questions. The first is about uplift in Model 1. Martin mentioned there was some evidence of uplift, uplift in the Southern River Valley. Are you able to include this in your model? First question. Um, do you want to have to answer that first and then we'll have the second question? Yeah, I can do. Um, the, yes, um, uplift not involved in any way in Model 1. And as a result, we have to we have to involve it in the way we deal with the results of Model 1. Um, and so we use what we have is a model with no uplift at all. What we have in the real world data is potentially some uplift um, and certainly some movement. And there's a the the there's lots of lots of research has shown that the the landscape of doggerland is 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 much more wibbly wobbly over the medium to long term i don't that's probably a scientific term for that but um yes uplift and other movement um is a factor um and so having a model that doesn't have that is one way of of trying to filter out the effect of that in the real world so you can look at individual data points you can look at where the the static model says the sea should be at a particular time you look at where it actually is based on the the, the dates you've got and that is a potential um, explanation for that difference and that's where they that's where all the I mean I always say computer simulation is a terrible answer generating machine but a great question generating machine and that's one of the one of the questions that would naturally come out of that so yes and um, very interesting good one. okay I think if we can do the second part of the question um the virtual cores remind me of synthetic boreholes we create and we're looking at sediment movement in the fen basin this is a very useful approach to integrating field and model data could you say a bit more about your initial conditions? Did you try to scale rainfall in relation to climate data? Um, how did you decide how much sediment was on the landscape initially? Did this vary spatially? Do you have different particle sizes in your sediment? Um, so again, a uh, 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 very relevant set of questions. Um, and I'd be interested in looking at the fan base and stuff. Um, the, the landscape is um, is treated as if it was a homogeneous unit so it erodes and deposits but there is there's there are no bits of it that erode quicker or slower than others um and the the rainfall is based on contemporary data um but like i say that's just that that is um that's just the easiest thing that was to do at the time that's that can certainly change model two is the one that i've had least time to to do work on actually model one's a lot far far more developed um and um yeah the how much sediment was on the landscape initially basically the landscape is entirely made of sediment there's no bedrock so it is infinitely erodible although it doesn't it doesn't in effect it doesn't erode particularly um much um, so um, no, no, no particle sizes or anything like that. But it is certainly um, it's certainly something that can be included, and is something that I'm aware isn't included, and has to be taken into account with the with how you use the data. 